question. Some of them are right, some of them are wrong. Next week is not the election. The election's the week after next. Next week could be the week, I guess, let me think, probably, could be the week that the Indians won, win their first World Series since 1948. So that could be, but we don't know that for sure. But the one thing that we do know for sure and is correct is next week the design for your project is due. All right. So therefore, um, as I mentioned, sort of now for the rest of the semester, that's like a really important job. Because it's not that we're not studying important stuff now, all right, from now to the end of the semester. But we've really studied a lot of the stuff that you will likely need to complete your project. There's some extra stuff that we're going to study that you might be able to use to benefit your project. But for the most part, you could probably do a good portion of your project. You could complete it now. All right. And the one thing you definitely need to be able to complete by next week is, is a design. And therefore, I thought it would be worthwhile for me to spend just a few minutes reviewing what the design consists of, just to try to remove any doubt in people's minds. And so I'll try to do it on one page. I don't want to repeat everything that I've done before, but just as a reminder. And I also want to take questions from any of you if you've started it and you are not sure what you need to do for a certain part or you kind of got stuck or, or even if you've just thought about starting it, which is good if you've thought about starting it. would even be better if you have actually started it, but if you've thought about it, that's better than forgetting that we even had a project, I suppose. Um, but uh, even if you just thought about it, I'd like to go over the steps so that maybe you um, can point out areas that you're not sure about. So the project consists of four, uh, four written portions in a document. So four of the five portions of the project will be like in a Word document. And you can put them all in the same Word document. If it's easier for you, you can separate them out in the separate sections. That really doesn't matter to me. Or separate Word documents, I mean. Um, the four portions of the document are strategy, scope, structure, surface, and then finally wireframe. Oh uh, no, not wireframe. Prototype. The book I first read these in made a point of having everything start off with S. And I forget if they had a word for prototype that started with S, but maybe, I don't know. These will all be written in a Word document. It um, doesn't have to be a Word document. You could do it in open office or you could export a PDF or whatever. It doesn't matter. But it's not HTML. The prototype is your HTML and CSS code. The strategy section is going to contain an overview, goals, and personas. The overview is where you write a paragraph that describes what your site is about. All right. Fairly straightforward. The, uh, per, the, the goals are what people intend to get out of your site and why you have intended to create it. Now, um, you should have three goals for each persona. What is a persona? Uh, a persona is a sort of a profile of what you would expect a typical user to visit your site to be like. And you should have three of these. 
So we talked about the example of Lorain County Community College. If we, were, if we were coming up with three personas for that, one persona might be a prospective student, one persona might be a current student, one persona might be a member of the community that doesn't want to enroll in classes but wants to take advantage of some of the other benefits of Lorain County Community College. Fourth persona could be a faculty staff member. All right. Typically, the larger the site, the more personas there's going to be. And for your site, being that it's not that particularly large of a site, three personas seems reasonable. Um, and there'll be goals for each of these personas. And there'll be goals for you as the creator of the site. Now, that's, why, that, that's one place where you have to sort of use a little bit of your imagination. All right? Because, you know, why are you writing this site? You're writing this site to get a good grade. All right, but that's not an acceptable goal. All right, you can't say I'm, I'm doing this because um, it's an assignment in the class. You, you have to pretend that you're like an organization that has created the site, or you're a zealous fan of a particular video game, and, and you really want to spread the word to, to everyone out there how great this game is, or whatever. All right. If you have trouble with any of these, um, let me know and I'll be glad to help. I will also be glad to help um, if you have a draft of it, if you've gotten a couple of students have like shown me what they've done so far and asked are they on the right track. And that's really useful. Uh, I do ask that if you're going to do that for me to email it to me as opposed to posting it to the Dropbox. And that's just sort of a general thing. If you have questions about something, email it to me. Don't post it to the Dropbox. The Dropbox is intended for like the final submission where you're pretty confident that it's done correctly and you're submitting it to be graded. So if you have questions about things, it's better to email. I get to those a lot quicker than I get to grading. All right? That's the strategy segment of it. An overview, personas or profiles of typical users that are going to be using your site, and finally, goals for the organization that's creating the site, or goals, or rather, and goals for the different personas. All right? One thing about the goals is they ought to be as specific as possible, and they ought to relate to the content of the site and not web design. So, for example, you, a, a good goal would be something like um, people will access the site to determine if their computer has the proper specifications to run such and such video game. That would be a valid goal, all right? Because that's about the content of the site. That's about the video game. A good, uh, a bad goal would be something like the site is going to have good, get, good navigation. The site will look pleasing. Well, yeah, the sites are supposed to have those things. You know, that's, that's almost an assumption, or that is an assumption. So there's no need to put that down as a goal. The goal ought to relate to your specific content and your specific topic, and not simply be stating web design principles. All right? So that's the strategy part. In some respects, that's the most important part. That defines what it is you're after, what you're trying to com complete. You know, the closer that your final website is to what you have defined as the goals, the better that your website satisfies those goals, the better job that you've done on your website. All right. The scope section is really just a list of requirements. And what do I mean by requirements? I mean specific pieces of content that are going to be on the site. It's just a list, a bulleted list. The site will have the specifications for computers to run, the, the, the minimum required specifications to run this video game. The site will have an overview of the five main characters in this video game. The site will discuss um, how the controls work in this video game, and so on down the line. 
All right? Those would all be requirements. They relate to specific content that is going to be on the site. All right? How many of these are you going to have? Um, if you have less than 10, I might be concerned and bring it up to me. If you had more than 25 or 30, you might be doing too much work. All right? So just to give you a range. I hate to give an exact number because then students, you know, um, you know, try to try to game the system by saying, "Oh, look, I have that number." Yes. Right. That sounds about right. Uh, the statement was is that. Um, that, that you tied the goals to the, requ uh, yeah, you tied the requirements to the goals. In other words, for each of the goals, you listed the requirement that would meet those. Um, and then you had goals for the organization making the site. So that gives you about 12 requirements. And yeah, that, that's definitely uh, in the ballpark. And that's a good way. Uh, and that brings up a great point, right? The requirements are directly mapped to the goals, all right? In other words, the goals say what you hope to achieve. The requirements explain how you're going to achieve it. You know, um, if if you are if if one of the goals of your site for the video game, let's say, uh, are to um, uh, one of the goals uh, of one of your personas, maybe the persona is someone who's never played this series of video games. So maybe one of the goals would be to um, explain to the people, you know, explain uh, um, to uh, the visitors of the site. Um, why this is such a great game. Well, there might be a lot of reasons for it. It might have a great story, it might ha and you could put those as requirements, explain the story, and so on. Now, the only thing I will say about that, well, that's definitely a good approach. Um, it, it's not always one-to-one. -one. In other words, you might have several things on your site that help accomplish a goal. So, you might have three goals, and maybe one particular thing you have um, several pieces of content to do that. You know, thinking of a slightly different example, like uh, maybe uh, there'll be information on, on LC's website to help you choose a major. Well, that's a big question, right? So, exactly, exactly. Now, you don't want to be an inch deep and a mile wide, right, but you don't also want to just have six pages about one specific thing, you know, you want to have a little bit of, you want to balance between breadth and depth uh, uh, on the topic. And what helps guide that is the goals. But getting back to the, um, like picking a major, there could be a lot of things that would help a student pick a major. Um, career outlook, you know, is, is there, uh, what, what are the expected uh, job openings in that field over the next, what are the projections for the, the, the field over the next certain number of years. What is the salary? How much education do you need? Those are three things that might all relate to the goal of what you need to, you know, what will help you choose a major. Maybe interviews with the people that are actually doing the job would be another piece of content. All right? So for some goals, you could have many requirements. And each requirement could actually address a couple different goals. For example, a, a um, you know, a, um, you know, the, the minimum requirements uh, for software or for hardware to run a particular video game could address the goals of a variety of different users. So, therefore, again, these are tied to goals. And you want to make sure that all your goals are covered with these requirements. And that each requirement really corresponds to at least one goal. Because if you have something on your site that really doesn't correspond to a goal, then you might not need it on your site. All right? Structure. Structure part consists of two things. One is a structure chart. The structure chart is going to look like an organizational chart, sort of.
where you have a home page, you have pages off of that, and maybe you have pages off of that. The idea of this is, in the requirements, you list all the stuff that is going to be on your site. In the structure part, you say, well, how are those going to be organized in the pages? And how are those pages going to be structured? You probably should also describe briefly why you picked that particular organization. For uh, any topic, you could organize the information for the topic any number of different ways, right? So you want to describe why you chose a particular way of organizing the information um, on your website. The surface stage is wireframe. Creating some wireframes. And we've sketched out wireframes throughout the semester and they relate to sketches like this, where you describe this is the header, this is the navigation, this is the content area, and this is the footer. Given that we're developing smaller sites, not gigantic sites, um, one wireframe may be adequate for your entire site. All right, that might be all you need is one wireframe. Um, if you have some pages that are a little bit different for a particular reason, for example, oftentimes a home page will have a slightly different design than the rest of the pages. Or you might have a photo gallery that will have a slightly different design than the rest of the pages. All right? Then you would have maybe a second wireframe. If you want to do more than two wireframes, um, yeah, you're welcome to, but well, you might you might want to talk to me because maybe really maybe really you don't need to have more more than that. Yeah. Um, well, you could set it up a lot of different ways. A typical one might be something like this. where you have a header, you have your site's navigation, you have your footer, then you have an image, and maybe you have thumbnails down here, or maybe you have a back button and a forward button, where you could click and go to the next image. Or, so it, uh, there's any number, and I'm sure you've seen photo galleries on the web. There's a lot of different ways that you could structure it. But, for example, the photo gallery might incorporate into the wireframe how you navigate through the photos, in addition to how you navigate through the site. All right. Those four steps are the written parts of the design document. Finally, we have the prototype. And the prototype is your rough draft, if you will, of your HTML and CSS. You don't have to have all your pages completed for your prototype. I think I asked for three. And everything doesn't have to be perfect in it. All right? But, it should be enough that if you were going to show someone, that have a pretty good idea of what the finished product is going to look like. It is okay to have Greek text in your prototype. Um, it would be better if you didn't have at least completely Greek text in, in your prototype, but it's acceptable to have Greek text in your prototype. Um, again, think of, think of if you're working on a really large project. You know, you might be the web developer who's, who's running the show and, and creating the website, but you might be getting your content from someone else. You know, maybe, for example, if you were doing a, a website for LC, maybe the marketing department was going to write up um, information about that, or maybe CISS department was going to write information about careers in computer information systems or whatever. So. You might be depending on other people to get the pro uh, uh, some of your content. 
You know you need that content, you know, so you can put it in your requirements, but you're not necessarily the person responsible for that. In which case, well, you still want to develop a mock-up of your page, and it would be great if you had the content or a rough draft of the content, but if you didn't, then you could stick Greek text in so at least people get some sort of idea of how the page is going to be laid out. All right. Questions. This is due sometime next week. I don't remember the exact day, but it is next week. Yes? How what? Um, they're they're typically like they're typically like one. A requirement is like you know like one pretty specific, well-defined statement. So one requirement might be if I had a requirement for uh, if I was doing a website for a restaurant, one requirement might be that the full breakfast, lunch, and dinner menu will be available on the site. All right, that's a requirement. That's, that would be one requirement, right? And it, it specifies. It doesn't specify how it's going to be on the site. Is it downloaded or, you know, is it going to just appear on a page? But it, it, it's pretty clear. Um, the idea with the requirement is um, the more specific you make it, the, the more um, apt you are to get what you want. Because then the person, remember, who you're making this document for. You're making a document for everyone on the team. So the people that you're making the website for are going to look at it, but also the people that are, are developing it. You might be, for example, the, the supervisor of a web team, you know, if this was a very large website. You may not be doing all the coding yourself. So if you give some, uh, if, you, if you gave a, uh, a more vague requirement like the site will show what kind of food that we, we, uh, is available at our restaurant. Well, that's almost saying the same thing as saying that the menus are going to be available on the site, but it's not. And someone that's going to write the code for that might say, yeah, well, we sell Italian food. All right, there you go. <laughs> you know, whereas, no, that's, you know, we want more specific than that. We want to actually show the menus, you know, or, or whatever. So you want to make them as specific as possible. The, the more specific you can make it, the easier it is for everyone to understand that there, there not to be any misunderstandings, and the more likely that you're going to deliver, you know, what people need and, and what you said you're going to deliver. All right. But again, it doesn't need to be a book about each one, you know. It, you, don't, you, wouldn't need to, you wouldn't need to, for example, uh, describe everything that's on the menu. Well, on the, the dinner menu, there is a section for appetizers and a section for, you could just say, I want to show the menu on the site, you know, and that, that would be adequate. Questions? You know, in doing this again, this being a classroom situation, you know, this is a little bit different uh, than, um, you know, real world situations. But try to keep in mind the purpose of, of uh, developing these documents. And the purpose is to show the people that you're making the site for what your plans are. So they're not surprised at the end of a month when you deliver a website that looks nothing like what they, had, what, they, what they really want, and also communicate between the different people that are going to be working on the site to say this is what it should look like. So everyone's on the same page, and hopefully you deliver something that's good. I will say, those of you that are CISS majors, um, you will be taking um, a system development class um, that really brings together and, and actually has you work on real projects. Um, you know, they find organizations on campus or in the community and you work on a project and you take it from beginning to end and you go through the process. And when you do that, you know, you're, you are actually working with other members of the team and you are working with actual real life users and the ability to explain what you're planning on doing is, is really of, of pretty high importance. So this is a good opportunity for you to practice that. And you'll get more practice uh, on that in a probably a little more realistic situation um, in the system development class. All right, other questions. It is always 
fun grading these projects. And that isn't like a sarcastic, oh, it's always a lot of fun grading. No, it genuinely is fun because it's, in, it's really interesting to see what people are interested in. And people usually do a pretty good job on these. Um, I will say, like, uh, what was I grading yesterday? Oh, I was grading the, um, the, the one assignment. You, you've had a couple of them, but I was grading the first one where you varied the CSS between the two pages. And for the most part, with, with a couple exceptions, um, people did such a great job on those. They really, they had some good pages. The, the, the pages were really different between the two. And it's, it's really fun looking and, and grading at things and seeing what people came up with. All right, so for the most part, good job. Um, read the comments, um, as always, um, and ask questions if you don't understand something that I mentioned. All right. Our next topic, which we'll probably spend the rest of today on, and we'll talk a little bit about um, probably on Wednesday, I would think, is website accessibility. And website accessibility specifically means allowing people to access the site regardless of their physical abilities and or disabilities. All right. Um, if you think about it in the real world, there are things that are put into buildings, for example, that help people who are uh, with different disabilities get around and are and able to use the building just as anyone that doesn't have a disability. Can you name some of the things in this building that um, are useful for people with disabilities? in getting around. A little button for the door, all right? Like, for example, like if you're upstairs, and I think most of the doors have it, um, you, you, there's a button you can press, and, and it will automatically open up the door. So um, actually, some of them, uh, some people, like if you're a regular on campus, you actually get a little remote that you can press and, and open it up. Uh, a guy I know at the, at the radio station that's in a wheelchair has a remote that he can, he can open up the door um, at a distance. Anything else you can think of? Ramps would be an example. Um, somewhere out here in the courtyard, you know, there's steps that go down from here down to the courtyard, but there's also a ramp that you could, you could uh, go up. Elevator. All right. Anything else? Yeah, real good. You, 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 I don't know if you noticed or not. I, I did go to close the door because it was getting noisy out there, but I also went to double check. If you notice, coming in, underneath the classroom number, there is the classroom number in Braille. All right. Um, how many of you had noticed that? All right, a couple people. A few people didn't. All right. Um, anything else? All right, those are good examples. We could probably think of more. Um, there, there is a special, there, there typically is a special stall in the restroom for people with disabilities. They have, uh, what would you say, handles on the, on the wall or a bar to help to, to assist them. Um, and we could probably think of uh, a few others as well. All right. Um, now. These things will help people with disabilities, provided that there aren't obstacles that will prevent them from using them. For example, you know, another thing that we want to do, in addition to providing spe specific accommodations, is we want to we want to make sure there aren't any obstacles as well. All right. So, for example, um, you know, with the 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 bathroom stall for people with disabilities. You could, you know, that's great and all, but if the door getting into the bathroom is too narrow to navigate through uh, with a wheelchair, then that would sort of uh, eliminate the purposefulness of, of that. So you want to provide accommodations, and you also want to remove obstacles when you're dealing with 
making things accessible to people with disabilities. All right? In addition to the accommodations we make for people with disabilities when we build a building, all right, there's also what is called assistive technology. All right? And assistive technology can be something like the clicker for someone in a wheelchair that can press it and automatically open the door. Or assistive technology could be, in the case of someone who is visually impaired, could be a dog, seeing eye dog. Or it could be a white cane that they use. Or it could be a wheelchair, or so on. So the way that you make something accessible or more accessible to people with disabilities is a combination of their use of assistive technology and special accommodations that you make. Now here's an interesting thing about accommodations, all right? Ideally, in many cases, accommodations either are not noticed by people that don't have the disabilities or, in fact, are sometimes useful for people who don't have the disabilities. All right? So, for example, have any of you ever taken the elevator up to the second floor? Any of you have? No? Okay. I have. All right. I have because I had a, a hip injury. All right, so there were days that when my hip was sore um, that I took the elevator up there. I don't, I didn't, I didn't, or I don't have what you would consider a disability, all right, but I had a temporary condition that made those accommodations useful for me as well, all right. When else, I, I've also taken up the elevator in other instances. I know you're going to say, wow, this guy's lazy. Why doesn't he just walk up the steps, right? But if I'm carrying a lot of stuff, all right, if I have a lot, you know, sometimes my bag weighs a ton and I might be carrying my food for the week or whatever, and it's, I don't want to take the, the, the stairs up, sometimes I'll take the elevator up. If uh, people that have, are pushing around a cart, an AV cart, you know, that has stuff on it, they might take the elevator for that reason, all right? People that have one of those uh, fancy backpacks that have wheels on it that you drag around, they might use the ramp that was put there for people with wheelchairs. All right? You might use the button to open the door again if your arms were full, carrying stuff or whatever. A kid, or uh, not a kid, but a parent with a kid in a stroller might use those for that reason and so on. So accommodations that you make for people that have disabilities in many cases are beneficial to others under certain com conditions, all right? Under certain conditions, they're, they're useful for people, even people that don't have those disabilities, you know, for temporary sort of circumstances. Or, at the very least, a lot of times you're able to ignore them and they don't really get in your way. So, for example, um, the Braille out there. Uh, many of you have noticed, but I'll bet you there's a lot of people on campus who have walked into this classroom without realizing that there was Braille underneath the door number. All right? It's very useful if you, if you need it, but if you don't need it, it's not like it gets in the way. All right? Now, accommodations on a website are very similar to that. You make accommodations for people that have disabilities in accessing your website. They have assistive technology, which helps them access the website. And the accommodations that you make are either something that can help people, even when they don't have disabilities, or, at the very least, don't get in the way. Don't really bother people that don't have the disabilities. What I'd like to do, though, is to start out and let's consider all the disabilities that would affect someone's ability to access a website. In the real world, we can think of several of them. You know, what are some things that, that compromise your ability to walk around the, on campus? Well, if you have some sort of injury and you're in a wheelchair, that would be one. 
If you're blind, that would be another. We could come up with a whole other list of them. What about on a website? What are some of the disabilities which affect people's ability to access material on a website? There's one that I hope we're able to get. No internet access, that's a problem, but that's not really a, a disability. I'm talking about something, some disability for a, a given person that has that. That is an important consideration, but Blind, yeah. Blind is, is obviously sort of the, the obvious one, you know. The web is such a visual medium that, you know, if you're blind, you can't access the web in the manner that other people access the web. All right? So, I'm going to put up Instead of blind, I'm going to put up vision, and underneath vision, I'm going to put blind. How do blind people access the web? If you're blind, does that mean that you cannot access the web at all? Yeah, they, have, they actually have what's called a screen reader. And, and let me try to pull it up here um, and, and pull up an example of a screen reader just to show you what it's like. And, it, it's, it's definitely not going to be fun for us to do that, but if you imagine being blind, and this is the only way you had to access the web, you'd make it work. It would become usable for you. So let me go in. Now Windows has built into it a built-in screen narrator somewhere here. under ease of access. All right. Right now the narrator is off. I'm going to turn the narrator on. And we can even choose the voice that we have. David or Zira. And we can change the speed and the pitch. So, let me see if we can actually hear this. I'm going to turn the volume up. Internet Usage Policy, Google Chrome Window, OK button. Google Chrome is requesting attention. Tool Tip, 19. Cancel button. I hit Tab, and it, it went and it read the button. OK button. Internet Usage Policy. Desktop, Lorain County Community College, Home. Tab, Lorain County Community College, link. Tab, login, link. Tab, search, link. Tab, canvas, link. My canvas, link. Tab, 
help link okay value http colon slash slash www new tab google chrome win narrator settings window <laughs> exiting narrator now i'm not an expert in using this and i will say that people that um uh, this is sort of a low-end narrator. There are, there are much more full-featured narrators that are available that you can purchase that aren't built in, that, that you can purchase that are more expensive but do, do a better job than that. And it's amazing. When, when you hear that, you think, how could anyone ever be able to access the web that way? All right? But I'll, I'll tell you, I, I um, did a, a summer fellowship at NASA, uh, Lewis Research Center, um, and there was a blind high school student. Um, they hire a lot of high school students to be summer interns. And this girl was, was able to do pretty much everything that all the other interns did. I mean, she worked on you know, Excel spreadsheets. She did PowerPoint presentations. She accessed the web. She chatted with her friends on instant messaging instead of working. You know, she did everything that, uh, that the regular, uh, that, that, the, that the people without disabilities, uh, high school interns did. Um, now, occasionally, um, she would run into an obstacle, and she would call me over to, to help her, you know, like, what's on my screen now? You know, I, 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 the narrator isn't telling me what's on the screen now or whatever. And, and I'd, I'd help her through that. It was, it was odd because I would, uh, you know, she would work with the screen off. She wouldn't even have the screen on. She came up to her computer, booted it, but with the, the screen on because she wasn't looking at the display. The other thing to re realize is that um, people that are blind can't use a mouse, all right, because a mouse requires positioning a thing uh, in a certain location on the screen, all right? And that's not really feasible, not really possible to do that. So people that are blind will typically navigate via the keyboard. If you notice, for example, I was hitting tab to move through the items, and it was narrating. As I pressed tab, it was narrating um, what it said um, that I had tabbed to, all right? So... It may seem difficult, and it may seem, you know, it may even seem impossible, but people do it, all right, provided we don't put obstacles in their way, all right? And one of the things about accessible design is learning, all right, yes, we have this great assistive technology, you know, the, yes, there are wheelchairs, and there are motorized wheelchairs, and, and there are screen readers, and so on, but... Um, what can we as developers do to make sure that we don't block those, um, those pieces of assistive technology? All right. So that's an important thing to remember. And we'll discuss that um, when we talk more uh, as we continue to talk about accessibility. The other thing to keep in mind is on this sheet, where I'm writing the disabilities, I wrote vision, and underneath that I put blind, all right? In addition to blindness as a disability, there's a whole bunch of other vision-related issues, all right? I don't know if there's a whole bunch of, but there are other vision-related issues that come into play when you're talking about accessing a website. What would be another example of being uh, of a vision-related condition? It isn't blindness, but could affect someone's ability to access information on a website. Yes, color blindness. You know, click the red button for. $10,000, click the green button to reformat your computer, you know. If you're colorblind, you can't tell the difference necessarily between those. Uh, interesting thing is that uh, people talk about colorblindness um, as though it's one thing. There's really a bunch of different kinds of colorblindness, all right. So in other words, people that are colorblind don't literally see the world in black and white, right. Um, there are, for example, there's a version of colorblindness where you cannot distinguish uh, red and green. 
red and green just sort of look like a brown muddle to you. Now, how do I know that if I don't have color blindness? There are actually color blindness filters that you can put on your web page to show people or to show you what your page would look like for people um, that are colorblind. And we'll look at those um, uh, again later on um, as, as we cover this. Those are one of the tools that you can use to help see if, they're, um, if your site's successful or not. What's another example of a vision-related condition? Dyslexia. All right. Um, that's, uh, that's good. That's a great example. I'm not, that one it depends if you consider that like a, a, a vision related or a, a cognitive related. But yeah, that's absolutely an issue. All right, um, dyslexia. What is dyslexia, by the way? Okay. Um, yeah, the, 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 the brain confuses the order of the letters. What, uh, anything else? Anyone want to add to that? It also kind of can affect like small like shapes. Too. It's not, okay. It doesn't always have to be words. Okay, it doesn't always have to be words? I actually didn't know that. that that's, that's interesting. Anything else? Um, it, might, it might be simply confusing letters. All right. So uh, a lot of people just through popular culture and all that think that it simply means that you see the words in, in reverse order, you know. Uh, and that's not the case. You, you know, the, the letters become jumbled, as was mentioned, that's a good way to say it. Or you might confuse letters, all right. Um, you know, a, a B and a D, because their shapes are very similar, might be confused by you, all right. Um, and again, that can affect your ability to understand that. All right. What's another one? Yeah, there, there, yeah, there would be, there would be that. That would be like partial blindness. All right, uh, you know, blindness in one eye. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not. I, I'm not familiar with all that. I mean, it certainly seems possible that that there there would be. Um, the one I was thinking is one that um, you know simply is having poor eyesight, right? Um, and especially, you know, as you get older. You know, one thing that we'll notice um, as we go through these is that as people age, they tend to have um, some aspects of several disabilities. You know, so for example, you know, as you get older, you don't necessarily become blind, but your vision gets poor. As you get older, you don't necessarily go deaf, but your hearing gets worse. As you get older, you can still move and use a mouse, but it might become painful for you, or you might have a hard time controlling the mouse as precisely as a younger person, and so on. So we'll actually come up with a new category for this and simply say age-related conditions, which is like a little bit of all of these different, you know, a small amount of all of these disabilities. All right, what we're going to do next time is we're going to finish defining the disabilities because a lot of people, when they think of disabilities that affect you on a website, think vision and then they're done with it. But there's a lot of other disabilities as well. So we want to define them, then we want to talk about what accommodations we can make in our website and what obstacles we can remove on our website to make sure to ensure the maximum accessibility of our site to people regardless of their abilities or disabilities. All right, any questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.